Welcome to part one of hyponatremia. Today we're gonna discuss pathophysiology, diagnosis, and workup. It's very important we understand the pathophysiology, otherwise you will always find hyponatremia confusing. Next video will be about hyponatremia treatment. Before we start, remember that you can get a summary of this video by subscribing to my Substack page. Link is provided below. Let's start. Have you ever asked yourself why do we treat hypokalemia with potassium? supplements the same for hypomagnesemia we give magnesium supplements while in hyponatremia do we give sodium supplements or sodium tablets to treat it it's not as simple as that so why is that because here there is a total body deficit in both potassium and magnesium while in hyponatremia there is really no deficit in total body sodium so what caused then hyponatremia simply because hyponatremia is a water balance problem in the extracellular fluid what do i mean by that that mean hyponatremia happening because of there is excess water in the ecf and it has nothing to do with total body sodium let's elaborate more on this as all of you know we define hyponatremia that sodium concentration less than 135 milli equivalent per liter i want you to focus here milli equivalent and liter the milli equivalent is the sodium amount in the extracellular fluid and the liter amount is the water amount in the extracellular fluid as you see from this equation that the more water water or the less sodium amounts of course we talk about the amounts this will lead to decrease sodium concentration so more water here will lead to decrease sodium concentration or hyponatremia or less sodium will lead to that and the opposite is true decrease water increase sodium will lead to increase sodium concentration now very important to understand that water balance is the main one responsible for hypo or hypernatremia the sodium amount by itself will not cause hypo or hypernatremia so if there is a decreased sodium intake it will not cause hyponatremia on its own unless it's accompanied by increased water in the extracellular fluid so if i can say the sin behind all hyponatremias is excess water in the extracellular fluid remember that very well so in order to understand what causes excess water in the extracellular fluid we need to understand how the body regulate the amount of water here to keep the sodium concentration tight between 135 to 145. If the body sends there is any deficits in the water in the ECF, it will trigger the thirst mechanism. So we start drinking water, water intake to replace the deficit of water. And this is very powerful. That's why you rarely see hypernatremia in somebody who can drink water. And the next thing, the decreased water here will trigger the posterior pituitary to release ADH and ADH lead to urine water retention. So water intake and water retention will reset the deficit here and the water amount will go back to normal. That keeps sodium concentration within normal limit. The opposite is true. If there is excess amount of water here, the thirst mechanism will be deactivated, the release will stop, and then we will have, if there's no ADH, we will have water excretion, urine water excretion. While here we have concentrated urine. And I think here it's, it's good time Time to tell you that thiazide diuretics give you concentrated urine thiazide almost you can say they are equal to ADH so they cause concentrated urine while loop diuretics cause uh, diluted urine that's why you see much more hyponatremia in thiazide diuretics compared to loop diuretics the last thing that I want to mention here that in order for us to have an intact urine concentration or dilution we need intact kidney we need intact GFR if the GFR is severely reduced then this urine excretion water excretion and water retention will be impaired so we need adequate GFR remember that and that's why in end-stage renal disease or advanced coronary kidney disease we may develop hyponatremia because of this issue in almost all clinically relevant cases of hyponatremia you have to have 
these elements. Continued water intake and impaired water excretion, i.e. urine water retention. And basically that's done by ADH, right? Or thiazide diuretics. But so you need both in order to develop clinically significant hyponatremia. And based on the condition, one element may be more prominent than the other. Let's say in ex extreme cases of excessive water intake like psychogenic polydipsia, beer potomania, in both there is large amount of water intake that exceed the maximum capacity of the urine to excrete water. And that's why there is an element of impaired water excretions. It will lead to hyponatremia. Or any condition that lead to ADH, excessive ADH release, lead mainly to impaired water excretion. But it will only cause hyponatremia if there is continued water intake. These elements work together to give us excess water in the extracellular fluid and then decrease sodium concentration as we explained. Now, one exception to that rule is the osmotic shift of water from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. So if there is an accumulation of any active osmotic substance here, large accumulation, that will increase osmotic pressure here and then will drag water this direction. That means water in the extracellular fluid become more and excess water here will lead to hyponatremia. Accumulation of substance like glucose in large amount like in critical hyperglycemia or hypertonic mannitol for example that will lead to increase on the osmotic pressure here and water shift this way so this is a true hyponatremia because there is excess water but the difference here there is no involvement of adh or water intake and simply this one is treated by shifting glucose you give insulin for example or stop mannitol and then the water will shift back and the amount of water go back to normal and sodium concentration goes back to normal so what trigger adh release other than tonicity one of the main factors that trigger adh release is the intravascular volume if the intravascular volume here become low decrease intravascular volume or decrease effective circulatory volume. The baroreceptors here will sense decrease in the pressure and it will send signal to the pituitary, posterior pituitary to release ADH. And as you know, ADH will lead to urine water retention through the kidney, right? If you have a functioning kidney. And if there is continued water intake by the patient, this will lead to decreased sodium concentration or hyponatremia. So what can lead to decreased intravascular volume? Volume depletion, right? Like vomiting, diarrhea, third spacing, etc. And volume overload, like an ed peripheral edema, ascites, etc. Both will be sensed by baroreceptors and the sequence of events will happen. And that's another reason to tell you that sodium concentration has nothing to do with total body sodium. Why? Because volume depletion or volume overload corresponds to the total body sodium, I'm going to call it TBS, total body sodium, in the ECF. Higher total body sodium means increased ECF size means volume overload and the opposite is true and that's why we restrict sodium intake in a volume overload we don't restrict sodium in hypernatremia right so again that's another evidence that hyponatremia is water balance issue now these are appropriate causes of the release of adh so we mentioned there is appropriate causes of adh release but the brain sometimes release adh inappropriately without a change in intravascular volume or tonicity and that's what we call this syndrome of inappropriate adh with long list of causes of this problem whether it drugs infections tumors pulmonary disease etc and whether it's appropriate or inappropriate adh release it will lead to the same effect increase urine urinary water retention and if this is associated with continued water intake this will lead to decreased sodium concentration or hyponatremia so we mentioned sodium concentration is equal to the sodium amount in ecf and water amount in ecf so what if there is decrease in the sodium intake what's going to happen by itself it will not really cause relevant or clinically relevant hyponatremia but if this is associated with continued water intake both will lead to hyponatremia 
And clear example of that, what we call tea and toast syndrome. Their diet has very low load of solute or sodium, which can lead to hyponatremia if there is continued water intake. Now, serum osmolality, as all of you know, mainly contribute by sodium. Then glucose, then BUN, I don't consider it. I usually cross it off because it moves freely from intracellular to extracellular fluid. So it has no impact on the osmolality. With all cases of hyponatremia, you can guess that we will have because low sodium concentration we will have decreased osmolality all we call them hypotonic hyponatremia the exception remember we said there is hyponatremia that happened from osmotic shift of water from the intracellular to the extracellular fluid in these patients we have increased osmolality and that's what we call hypertonic hyponatremia you know, give the example of critical hyperglycemia or mannitol now where you see normal osmolality but on the blood work you see low sodium concentration or hyponatremia this is simply an artificially low sodium concentration it's not true and it's because of old lab techniques that's why i think you will never see it again because we have modern lab techniques and it used to happen because of increased lipids usually triglyceride more than a thousand or high proteins like in multiple myeloma if you see normal osmolality and you see low sodium concentration this is what we call pseudo hyponatremia again i don't think you will see it anymore so the moment i get sodium value less than 135 the next step the first step is to check serum osmolality and it's usually included in the blood work so if it's above 290 then this is considered hypertonic hyponatremia right and if it's normal, this is what we call isotonic hyponatremia or we call it pseudo hyponatremia. Stop there. There is no need to do any further testing or any further treatment here. And if it's less than 270, this is hypotonic hyponatremia. And this is by far the most common one in, cl in clinical practice. Hypertonic hyponatremia, as we see here, it's sodium less than 135 plus serum osmolality more than 290 milli is more per kg. And as you see, critical hyperglycemia is the most common one here to cause hypertonic hyponatremia. So the first thing you look for when there is zero osmolality more than 290, look at the glucose level. Now, what if there is hyperosmolarity, the serum osmolality above 290, and the glucose is normal or slightly elevated? What do we do? Then we start suspecting exogenous substance exists in the ACF causing increased osmolarity. And what do we do sometimes? We do something called osmolar gap. And basically, we take the major osmolality that comes from the lab and the CMP or BMP, and we do calculate the serum osmolality ourselves and see if there is a gap here called osmolar gap. That means there is exogenous substance causing increased uh, serum osmolality. And big example is mannitol. So if the patient already you see it on hypertonic mannitol, then that's give you the explanation. And the smaller gap has to be, of course, high. Other things, including ethanol and ethylene glycol, and maybe other substance. So if you see serum osmolality above 290 and the glucose is normal or slightly elevated, you can calculate the osmolar gap and start thinking of these substances as a cause of hypertonic hyponatremia. Hypotonic hyponatremia by far is the most common one and most challenging one in clinical practice, where sodium is less than 135 and the serum osmolality is less than 270. The first thing whenever I'm encountered with hypotonic hyponatremia, I check does the patient have as a renal failure decrease GFR or on thiazide diuretics because that explain this hypotonic hyponatremia unless I'm suspecting an additional causes with it. So check if the patient has renal failure whether acute or chronic and thiazide diuretics because you may stop there. You don't need to go further on differential diagnosis or work up. The next thing, check volume status to guide your differential diagnosis here. The first thing, does the patient have signs of fluid overload or what we call hypervolemia? This is the easiest one to diagnose. Somebody with hypotonic hyponatremia and signs of fluid overload, stop there. 
you don't need to do any further work up that's the cause of their hypotonic hyponatremia and we'll come to the treatment which is diuretics of course the second easiest one is hypovolemia if it's severe if there is a clear volume depletion somebody coming to you saying i'm having vomiting diarrhea or third spacing so history and physical exam is key in guiding your differential diagnosis in hyponatremia the problem if there is mild volume depletion you don't see that strong size of volume depletions and euvolemia or SIADH, severe hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, psychogenic polydipsia, beer potumania, low sodium load or, or intake like T and TOS syndrome. This is where it gets interesting between mild volume depletion and euvolemic. And here even, which one is causing euvolemic? Severe hypothyroidism will definitely, you will identify that in history and the TSH will be markedly elevated. So if you suspect that, Adrenal sufficiency also based on history you can suspect that all these history is key and physical examination very important So what's next if I cannot tell again between mild volume depletion or euvolemic causes of hypotonic hyponatremia that's when we come to further workup now as all of you know the main test that we sent urine sodium urine chloride and urine osmolality then it's important to know that these values here can be altered by IV fluid resuscitation and recent diuretic use it can alter the value of these tests also in most hospital urine osmolality takes time in my facility it takes five days to come back by that time the patient is already home it's useful if i get it within an hour or so we always recommend to obtain urine chloride along with urine sodium because there are certain conditions especially those with the metabolic alkalosis where the patient spills sodium in the urine but preserve chloride like somebody with vomiting i'll come to that in a second now if the history did not and physical exam did not point out to the cause of hyponatremia me you come to the urine test as we said now intravascular volume depletion which means either volume overload or true volume depletion the urine sodium and chloride will be low right it makes sense less than 20 or 25 milli equivalent per liter except in over diuresis somebody who's volume depleted or dry from over diuresis because the diuretics the sodium and chloride will be higher in the urine so that doesn't apply also in vomiting only urine chloride will be low because remember vomiting is a strong stimulus for metabolic alkalosis for strong absorption of bicarb from proximal tubule so the body or the kidney starts spilling so sodium in the urine trying to rebalance or correct alkalosis so you see urine sodium more than 40 milli equivalent per liter the urine osmolar is elevated and typically above 300 sometimes 600 as the body trying to concentrate that urine and preserve as much volume as they can now excess water intake with beer potumania psychogenic polydipsia ecstasy use with drinking water and marathon runners remember these people they drink a lot of water and they have very low a very low load of sodium as well their diet is not great so the sodium is preserved less than sodium chloride less than 25 milli equivalent per liter in the urine and as you expect the urine osmolar will be very low trying to dilute as much as they can so less than 100 milli osmol per kg this IADH is famous of that urine sodium chloride above 40 and the urine osmolar is usually high or elevated above 300 milli osmol per kg and remember history and physical exam are the key really in 90% of cases to guide your diagnosis and workup of hyponatremia and we come to the end of part one of hyponatremia next in part two we'll discuss the treatment of hyponatremia if you found this video useful please give it a like share it with your colleagues subscribe to the channel if you have not done so and remember you can get a summary of this video by subscribing to my Substack page the link is provided below thanks for watching and i'll see you soon